Hi, everyone. I'm Yanis. Greek name, difficult to pronounce, maybe. Uh, very happy to talk to this conference today, first after uh, COVID. It's very exciting. I'll be talking about churn, bread and butter of the practitioners here. Um, so without further ado, a little bit of the agenda, a little bit of an intro, of the use case and focus, uh, the team that came together to make this project happen, uh, our MLOps toolkit, and I will elaborate a bit more on how to build a reliable model that you can trust, and conclude with some key takeaways. For those of you that don't know Danel, we are UK's number one homewares retailer. It's not a marketing statement based on global data. Um, our customers, our millions of customers can shop in one of our 175 stores in the, in the UK. We have more than 50,000 products in all sorts of categories from bedding to travel luggage. While we also have a, an e-commerce website, danelm.com, where you can also shop online. As about me, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm from Greece. Uh, I'm a lead data science at Danelm. I've been working in data science for the last five years. And for Danelm, currently, I've uh, been helping develop the, fir the first data science products. Right, so Danelm has existed for a few decades now. Uh, Danelm.com for also more than a decade. However, it's after COVID happened that, as with other companies, we saw a big growth on our website. That's because customers went from stores online to make the shopping during the lockdowns. Uh, that led Danelm uh, to invest in data uh, and therefore in, in analytics. And that's how we, the first data, si the data science use cases came about. Uh, amidst on ongoing cloud migrations, uh, limited engineering support, we had to find the first use case. And we chose re tackle retention and customer churn because we had the data sources already available and also a use case at hand uh, that we could improve. And in particular, we knew that our CRM team, um, in order to tackle attrition, uh, you know, when a customer stops uh, shopping with you, you want to send them an offer to uh, make them make another purchase, stay with you. Um, so what our CRM team was doing so far is uh, targeting customers after a few months of, let's say, inactivity. Uh, they, they're assuming if you haven't shopped for as long, you probably have lapsed. Therefore, here's an offer to make another purchase. However, you can see why that may not be the optimal way to do things. For example, the first customer A who shops very frequently, these little green arrows are purchases. If you wait for a long time, then this customer will may be gone, uh, maybe shopping with a competitor. Another customer B, uh, they shop more infrequently. Um, and if you target them at a fixed interval, uh, let's say four months, you end up sending them an offer right on time that they would purchase by themselves. So we saw that having a more personalized solution would improve uh, things a lot. So we went for a machine learning approach classification model. We considered uh, other approaches like uh, by till you die models or more complex heuristic rules that take into account purchase cycles. But we ended up with machine learning just because it's more general. You can feed it in. Uh, whatever features and data you want to enrich uh, your predictive accuracy. Um, and also, you could also have a buy till you die model feeding as a feature in a machine learning model. So it's more general, hence why we went for it. And we, there are all sorts of data sources you could be using, uh, from website activity to transactions to all sorts. But as a first POC, we started off with transaction data, product data, and of course, lockdown dates, uh, etc. So once... Uh, the, and the idea is you build a model that can score customers in your database, uh, assigns a chain risk to each one. And the idea is uh, after you, you target customers with your retention campaign, uh, if a customer has a risk above a certain threshold. Now, I've been talking about churn, but it's hard to define churn in retail because it's a non-contractual se setting. Customers can come and go, can shop with us whenever they please. So how, how should we define churn? Or a better, a better question is, how long should a period of inactivity be in order to constitute a churn and be worth of triggering an offer? So this is not a machine learning problem. Um, and to point this out, imagine we have this crystal ball. We have magic in our hands. And we know when a customer is going to make the next, next purchase with us. We have all the knowledge in the universe. For example, Amber, 
we know that she will never make another purchase with us. Uh, is, is, it, is that worth training, sending Amber an offer? I would say definitely yes, if this is not Chen, what is? Um, George, he's going to make his next purchase in a year. I, I'm, I would argue it also was an offer. But then you go down and say, okay, Amber's twin is going to make a next purchase in four months. You know that. Are you sending an offer or not? I'm not sure. It also depends on the industry. If you're a supermarket, your customer frequency is much more frequent. But let's stick with homeware for now. So four months, it's difficult to say. How about Julie next month? Well, I would say no, but again, how do you determine that? So the ultimate goal is to incentivize customers as often and frequently as appropriate to maximize the lifetime value. So that's, the, that's our goal. I don't know how to answer this question that I'm posing. So we went with a classic approach of a churn model defining a period of inactivity. But I wanted to pose this because I don't think people talk enough about this issue. So moving on, we decided to build a churn model. Um, if you don't want your model to go in the, uh, in, into the bin, first point out the obvious, get stakeholder buy-in to ensure adoption. So do not be like Pikachu where you say, okay, I've built an ML model, please use it. Uh, instead, we work closely with the CRM team, explain to them all the various different options we could work on a data science solution to make a more personalized uh, way of targeting customers. Um, and once the CRM team has bought in, it's very easy for the business to buy in the, in the project, uh, get data engineering support into the roadmap, get a product owner who acted as a product manager, coordinated all the teams, having had a clear roadmap with milestones for each team to deliver. And that's how we managed to build this model and put it in production and get adopted straight away. A little bit about our toolkit. We work in AWS with Amazon SageMaker for model development, registering our models there. The screen went off. Um, we also work with GitLab for code versioning and using PySpark and EMR clusters um, because our database is very big, so we need it uh, to be able to scale things up. So first thing, in order to build a reliable model that you can trust, uh, the first, train as you would deploy. So what I mean by that is having in mind how you're going to deploy a model. In our case, we would be deployed daily, or if not daily, weekly, but on any random day of the week. So what you don't want to do is you're not trying to answer the question Will a customer purchase again after the last purchase? That's their own question. It doesn't take into account recency, for example. Or another common mistake is you're not selecting a single date, let's say, the cut of the last date of your training set to make all your predictions, to calculate features and, and build your model based on a single date because you create a biased model like this. So our solution is for each customer or a, a big sample of customers, Choose a random day in your training set, but days and test sets. Choose a random day, and with respect to that reference date, calculate the past behavior features and the future behavior, that, uh, whether they purchase in the next period or you're trying to predict. In this way, you're able, your model is able to learn the relationship between features and the predictive variable in a, wide, in a, a range of different dates in your period. Next one is evaluate as you would in deployment. So we have to think, uh, once, the model, uh, once the model is deployed, how is it going to be used? It's going to be targeting customers once their customer's risk is above a threshold. Now, if you think how we usually evaluate models like this, you have your tabular data set. And let's say George, uh, he, he, has, he hasn't purchased for 255 days. Um, and the predicted likelihood to churn by the model is 82%, and you know what actually happened, George churn. And you evaluate your model on this data set, and go, oh my God, the model performs so well. However, this is a little bit uh, not very accurate depiction of how the model performs because we have too many customers like George that haven't purchased for a long time. Therefore, obviously the model is very good at predicting those. However, remember, the, the model in production will be targeting customers as soon as the churn risk went above the threshold. George would have crossed the threshold way before, and way before the model wouldn't be as good to predict whether George will churn. So that's something to figure out. But before we do that, 
we realize the need to select the threshold. So let's talk a little bit about that. So uh, going beyond generic metrics like AUC and, and F1 score, we all know that we need to select the right threshold because if the threshold is too high or too low, that can cause problems. You either hardly target anyone or you send too many offers out uh, to customers that would buy anyway. Now, when we make predictions, as Marianne said in the previous talk, um, you, the, a prediction can either be right or wrong, so we have the confusion matrix, and every element of the confusion matrix has costs and benefits associated to, you, to, to it. And the costs and benefits are very specific to the use case. For example, how much discount you give out in Europe. So the first one, uh, these are customers that you, that you predicted they wouldn't churn, and they didn't. So that's a correct prediction, and it doesn't carry any costs or benefits. Now, the next one, uh, segment B, uh, these are customers you predicted they wouldn't churn, but actually did. That's a wrong prediction, and there is a cost, uh, which is the profit that you would have got from the offer redemption had you targeted them, and they redeemed it. It's an opportunity cost. Now, segment C, these are customers that you predicted they would churn, but actually they would buy anyway, so you send them an offer, so you lose the money of the discount. And finally, segment D, this is the correct prediction, and you benefit from the offer you get from the offer redemption that you wouldn't have got had you not targeted them. So all of these elements will come together to create a custom metric that is tailored to our use case, so going beyond generic metrics. And this will be the incremental profit, which can be defined as benefits minus costs based on this matrix. And this will help us determine the threshold. So the, the benefit in front of the equation, um, the, remember these are customers, you get the offer redemption from them. They wouldn't have bought by themselves if you didn't target them. So you get the average order value mi minus the discount. There is a constant C there because not everyone that you target redeems the offer. So that's something to estimate. And from this, then you have to minus the, the segment C uh, that these are customers that would buy anyway, you send them a discount, so therefore you lose that discount in, because they didn't purchase full price. And finally, the segment B, these are customers, uh, as we said, this, this is the opportunity cost, uh, they churn, but if you had targeted them, maybe they wouldn't have, so you lose uh, this offer redemption that never happened. So, if we use this metric to find what the optimal threshold should be. So this is an example of our model. Uh, in this graph, you see the threshold on the x-axis. On the y-axis, you have the metric. And you see for very low thresholds, the incremental profit. And of course, you have the line at zero. This is the profitability when you don't target anyone. So you see for very low thresholds, when you send these uh, offers to too many people, the profitability is negative because uh, you lose too much money. And as you increase the threshold, you reach this sweet, sweet spot area between 0.6 and 0.9 uh, where the incremental profit gets maximized. And with that logic, you say, okay, my optimal threshold will be 0.7. Now, if you used the F1 score for this, which is a balance between precision and recall and doesn't take into account the particular discount you're using in your use case, then it would select a 0.5 threshold, which as you see, would have a, neg a negative profitability. Now, going back to the question we posed before, um, so how can we know when the, minim the minimum time when a customer, when the model would target a customer? So what we did to solve this is we built a simple simulation where we used um, historical customer data and daily tracked a customer cohort for just over four months. So every single day, the churn model will be flagging uh, customers will be, uh, will be uh, scoring customers, and as soon as a customer's churn risk goes above the threshold, um, then we assume the model would have targeted them with an offer. And at the same time, in parallel, the current rule set, so how, the baseline, how uh, the CRM team used to do things, it would also track customers, and after four months of inactivity, they would, we assume that their current rule set would be targeting them. And we can compare their performance, and again, using historical customer data. And what we found was that the churn model was much more precise in its predictions. Uh, the majority of customers it targeted was 
way sooner than four months, in less than 40 days. Um, in general, we saw that uh, customers with very low frequency, it used to target them much sooner because they have a very high churn risk rate, uh, while customers with very high frequency, even though they haven't uh, shopped for four months, many of them, they're still very likely to repurchase, therefore no need to target those. Uh, in terms of, but in, term, in terms of understanding what's more profitable, this is where the incremental profit uh, metric that we saw before comes in. And we found that the chair model generated twi twice as much compared to the previous uh, way of doing things. And a little bit of an overview of, of our model. So we used over 150 different features or customer behaviors for it uh, from recency frequency, different product categories that they shop from, um, different features on, around the purchase cycle. So in, in the end, the winning model was a random forest, as you can guess, from the trees. Um, it was a random forest model, and we tried to keep it as simple as possible, uh, limited the 150 different features that we tried to just six. Uh, you can see them there, related to the purchase cycle, how long do customers uh, take between the purchases. A nice one was category breadth, so we knew from analysis that the more different product categories uh, customers shop from, the more likely they are to shop with us again, and that's something the churn model picked up by itself and gave us confidence that it works as it should. And then obviously recency, frequency, and multi-channel was a very important one because uh, it turns out customers that shop from both stores and online are much more likely um, to shop again. And, and of course the effect of lockdowns, because a question before around lockdown, uh, the, the, this model was also trained in a period that we had lockdowns. And uh, we, in order to unbias the model, we captured those with features, for example, looked created feature like um, in the last, let's say, three months, how many days in that period were, were we under a national lockdown? And similarly, looking in the future, in the next three months, are we expecting to be in a lockdown? So the, this feature is in the final model. And obviously, looking at the future, it's always zero. We don't expect any lockdowns, hopefully. Um, so that, that's the, the model. And currently, uh, we're, we're testing it. It's in production, and we're testing it. Uh, we see promising results, but we still need to wait a, a little bit more longer for the control group to run a bit longer. Now, key takeaways from my talk. Uh, the obvious one, always get business buying first before building an ML product uh, if you want people to use it. Uh, another one was around defining churn in retail to achieve your goals, or maybe more accurately, <clears throat> defining when is most appropriate to target a customer in order to maximize the lifetime value, uh, which I think is a difficult problem. And finally, building a reliable model that you can trust that when you put in production, it will perform as, uh, as you think it would, and you're able to sleep at night. So train and evaluate as if in deployment. Try to mirror always what's going to happen in deployment as much as possible. And of course, having a simple model at the end with minimal sets of features, which is easy to debug, easy to understand. With just six features, you don't need uh, just eyeballing the value of the features. You can understand why it's making a prediction. You don't need sharp sometimes, for example, to interpret your model. And that's me. Thank you very much.